them properly. Um, Uh, Stefan is professor, professor of International Relations and Director of the Centre for Global Health Policy at University of Sussex. He's published widely on international politics of health, including uh, his latest book, Pandemics, Pills and Politics, Governing Global Health Security with John Hopkins University Press in 2018. Security and Global Health Towards the Medicalization of Insecurity, Polity 2010. Virus Alert, Security Governmentality in the AIDS Pandemic, Columbia University Press in 2009, and an earlier book on HIV and AIDS, Strategic Implications of HIV and AIDS in 2003. So as you can see, Stefan has been active in global health for, for many years, and I would add to that bio that he is a, he's been a stalwart of global health in IR, um, and really, really supportive of the BETA global health, global health Working Group, and also within ISA, so it's a real, real pleasure to have Stefan talking to us today, thank you. Uh, he's gonna be talking about the rise of bioinformational diplomacy, particularly um, the sharing or otherwise of genetic sequence data and new pathogens. So he's gonna be talking about the tensions, sensitivities, practices and enabling instruments surrounding timely international exchange of bioinformation. And then Daniela is Associate Professor of International Relations at the Department of Political and Social Sciences, University of Catania. She's also direct, Deputy Director for Research and Internationalization and Vice Coordinator of the PhD Programme in Political Sciences. She's also a Visiting Professor of Political Violence and Terrorism at the OSCE Academy in Bushek. And she's a member of the ECPR Executive Committee, Chair of the ECPR Standing Group on International Relations and a member of the ISA Governing Council. So it's a real pleasure to have you with us today, today as well, Daniela. And Daniela is going to be discussing current multilateral cooperation in the field of public health and how the EU and WHO um, will cooperate on policy or will have to address the challenges posed by the post pandemic world. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Stefan. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Adele, so much uh, for jumping in and for, for chairing uh, the session. Thank you to BISA for. Uh, for hosting the event and uh, most importantly thank you to the audience uh, for for showing up uh, today. I'm going to speak about a, a type of um, diplomacy um, that is not uh, routinely in the headlines but that has actually become very very important especially during COVID-19 and where there's also a bit of a very interesting international battle uh, uh, that has just erupted uh, in this field. And I think that will become a little bit more important uh, over the next couple of weeks and months. And this is um, to do with uh, what I call bioinformational uh, diplomacy. So over the next 15 minutes, all I really want to do is give a brief introduction to what bioinformational diplomacy is. I want to sketch out for you the kind of two competing models or systems uh, of bioinformational diplomacy that are kind of competing or, or vying for dominance uh, in the field at the moment. And then I just want to tease out at the end two or three implications, I think, uh, of the rise of this field of bioinformational diplomacy for the study of diplomacy and international relations more generally. So I'm going to jump straight in uh, with, with bioinformational diplomacy. Adele, you already uh, you have already given it away. So I, I think of bioinformational diplomacy uh, broadly as the kind of emerging field of tensions, sensitivities, but also enabling instruments uh, around the timely international exchange of bioinformation about global health emergencies. So one big bit of the definition is obviously bioinformation, which again, we can broadly understand as scientific information about the functioning and the processes around biological organisms. And in my talk today, I'm going to focus specifically on one such type of bioinformation, which is pathogen genetic sequence data. So one of the big changes or one of the big differences uh, about COVID-19 uh, and the international response to COVID-19 has been the availability of pathogen genetic sequence data. In the past, people would have to actually look at biological specimens under a microscope to understand what's going on. Nowadays, it's possible within a matter of days to sequence the entire genome uh, of a virus that is causing a new outbreak and to consider this, this completed sequence data. COVID shows really well how important this data has become. 
So if you ask, for example, well, how do we know that what was happening uh, in China was a new disease outbreak and not just influenza or something else? Well, pathogen genetic sequence data is what helped to identify uh, the new virus causing this as SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and also now we've seen in COVID-19 how this pathogen genetic sequence data can actually be used to do epidemiology, what's called molecular or uh, genomic epidemiology. Basically, you can compare the sequences of very many different viruses to begin to track how they are spreading around the world. You can look at where and when mutations arise. And from this, you can also deduce kind of transmission routes, transmission hotspots, and so forth. And of course, you can also uh, begin to track the emergence of new variants of a virus over time. So think of all the talk we've had about B117 or P1 or the South African strain, et cetera. This is all based on genetic sequencing uh, of the virus. Perhaps most importantly of all, of course, this data is now also central to the development of new biomedical interventions. So within days of Chinese scientists uh, uploading this, the first sequences of SARS-CoV-2, you had companies around the world using that data to develop new diagnostics for testing uh, against uh, COVID-19. And of course, also a whole new uh, generation of vaccines licensed for the first time in the form of the M mRNA vaccines uh, like Pfizer-BioNTech, which again are based on the genetic sequence data of the viruses. So, COVID is a really good, uh, good example of how important bioinformation is becoming, uh, particularly pathogen genetic sequence data. And that bioinformation is, is, is one half of the definition. Question that's still unanswered though is what does this have to do with diplomacy? So clearly bioinformation is uh, important, but what makes all of this diplomatic? Well, the key issue around pathogen genetic sequence data is that all of these things uh, in terms of risk assessment in terms of epidemiology, in terms of new medicines, only happens if stakeholders all around the world begin to openly share this data and share it rapidly once it becomes generated. The value of the sequence data isn't just any one particular sequence, but it's really realized at the moment that you begin to pool data from all around the world into a big kind of giant bioinformational database and you begin to compare all the sequences. And the problem is, is that we know from many past outbreaks that this data is often withheld and not shared. And the reason it's not shared and withheld often, despite the fact that there's a kind of global health rationale for sharing it, is because there are very many uh, tensions and sensitivities surrounding this data. So scientists, for example, who generate the data are very concerned that if they rapidly share this data, other scientists might publish uh, articles using that data much more quickly. And of course, in a competitive context where you know, citations uh, and, uh, and so forth drive grant capture and, and careers, this is, this is a problem. You also have industry, which can view such data as commercially proprietary information, especially if they're using it for the development of new biomedical interventions. Uh, and then you have governments, of course, who are also concerned uh, about such data uh, indicating a possible outbreak, which could have negative economic ramifications, especially if travel restrictions are imposed. Uh, conversely, this data could also be commercially very valuable. If it's the data that's used for a new biomedical intervention, a uh, country might uh, be very careful about uh, giving anything up or giving anything away that might have valuable intellectual property attached to it. So although the data looks kind of quite dry, you know, it's just about 30,000 characters for any particular virus, uh, there's actually a lot of uh, value and therefore also a lot of tensions and sensitivities uh, circulating through this data. And this is why um, in the past, uh, there have been quite substantial problems with getting this data to flow. And all of these kind of individual problems are traversed by an even bigger problem, which is of course uh, the, the protracted uh, and stark global health inequalities that still exist today in the world. So the data is seen to disproportionately favor the high income countries who can rapidly use this data to develop, for example, new vaccines. But of course, as we see now, as we speak, uh, uh, there's not really an equitable distribution of those benefits that are realized. And so the north-south inequalities are absolutely uh, uh, massive and central here as well. And so this is, gives you a flavor also why getting 
this data to move is also a diplomatic challenge. It's not just a scientific thing. It raises questions of, of equity and sovereignty. And so it's diplomatic, A, because we're talking about the international movement of such data across various national and sovereign jurisdictions. It's also diplomatic, B, because uh, as I've just outlined, this data is highly sensitive for many different stakeholders. It's not just uh, kind, of, kind of raw information. It's, it's potentially valuable information and therefore sensitive. And it's also a diplomatic, uh, in my view, because it therefore actually requires quite skillful negotiation with all the various stakeholders involved to overcome these sensitivities and to get this data to flow. And so it's not just bioinformation, it's also diplomacy. And you bring the two together, you have bioinformational diplomacy. Now, what I want to do next um, is quickly bounce out for you um, the two kind of rival systems of bioinformational diplomacy that exist in the world for sharing this data. So the old dominant and established model uh, is something called GenBank, which is hosted by the Na uh, National Institutes of Health in the United States of America. It's traditionally very much associated with the open science movement. And uh, it is what is called a public domain database. So the idea is that lots of scientists kind of, once they generate their sequence data, they, they, they put it into GenBank. And then pretty much anybody uh, in the world who has access to the internet can just go to this database, download the data, and GenBank places no further restrictions in terms of how this data can be used. GenBank also has uh, partner databases located in Europe and Japan. And so the three of these databases then form also an international network of these kind of public domain databases. And for many years, uh, they were the kind of core infrastructure for, for sharing the sequence data. However, uh, especially during global health emergencies, uh, there were many different problems. And because of the sensitive sensitivities that I mentioned, the data was not flowing. So a rival system was also generated, which is called GizAid. GizAid is run out of uh, Germany. It's a public private partnership. Uh, it started in the field of influenza and it uses a very different model, which is not a public domain model, but which is a data licensing model. So before you can get access uh, to the sequence data in GizAid, you have to go through a one-time process of positive identification where your credentials are verified, and you have to agree to a database access agreement, which sets out the conditions under which uh, you can access the data. And so they're quite quite a few stipulations that you will share your data with others in the Gazette network, but that you will not share it outside of the Gazette network, that you will acknowledge data gener generators in various publications and academic articles, that you may make effort, uh, efforts to collaborate with the people who generated this data and so forth. So it gives data prov providers uh, greater protections in terms of how their data is used, uh, but it does also place some restrictions therefore on how this data is used. GizAid uh, initially only worked in the field of influenza, where it quickly became quite successful and became the largest kind of database for influenza sequence data. But SARS-CoV-2 uh, has been a big game changer because this was also the moment at which uh, Chinese scientists then reached out to GizAid and asked GizAid whether they would also expand now beyond influenza, influenza to deal with coronavirus. And GizAid decided for the first time in its history to do so. And so now GizAid has rapidly become also the largest repository in the world, uh, nearly 1.5 million sequences now for SARS-CoV-2 sequence data. Uh, and so it's emerging as a very rapid and powerful challenger to the kind of public domain uh, model, but it is also beginning to generate tensions uh, with many other scientists who for a variety of different reasons still prefer uh, the old and unrestricted uh, uh, um, mechanisms of data sharing. And so nearly 800 such scientists have now signed an open letter calling for scientists uh, to deposit data about SARS-CoV-2 back into GenBank and other public domain databases. So you can see there's a real kind of rivalry and the real efforts now kind of, uh, 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 there's, a, there's a battle unfolding as we speak about uh, who will control the conditions under which this kind of information will be shared during future outbreaks.
Let me wrap up then by quickly uh, teasing out two or three uh, conclusions, because I think I am coming up to the end of my time. What I think is really interesting about this emerging field of bioinformational diplomacy is, is A, that it shows uh, you know, the increased relevance that information now actually has. So in the olden days, a lot of this, a lot of this work was still done with actual biological or physical samples, specimens, and, and it was all about it. It still had a material quality. Now it's increasingly about just digital data. You, people are doing it from their kind of from their computers. Um, now, of course, it's not just sequence data. There are many other types of bioinformation. So other protein structures that are being used to make vaccines. You have epidemiological data. You have data about clinical trials for vaccines and medicines and so forth. So bioinformation is actually becoming a really key kind of commodity internationally. And so I think one of the implications is that we see here is, 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 is I think, a need for us to, to think more strongly about international relations also as, as informational related. Second thing I think that's really interesting uh, about this is uh, for the kind of field of science diplomacy, which has become a kind of subfield in and of itself. Uh, but to me, what's really interesting about all of this is, is not just that, you know, scientists participate in formal diplomatic activities because they give evidence or they, or they create knowledge. But actually, and, you know, the field of STS has pointed this out for many years. You know, people like Latour. You, you know, scientific activity requires the kind of bringing together and 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 the concentrating of very many different types of artifacts and information sourced from all around the world, right? And you can see these scientists who want to publish, who want to do research, who want to help respond to the pandemic. They need to source this data from all over the world in order to do their scientific work. And so, actually, they also evolve of all kinds of infra diplomatic practices in order to get these scientific resources to move across potentially quite sensitive geopolitical or national divides. I think so this kind of opens up a whole new field of looking, looking not just at how do scientists kind of contribute to formal diplomatic processes, but also what are the kind of kind of proto or infra diplomatic practices that scientists themselves use to source the information that they need for their work. And then the last contribution, because I think I think my time is pretty much up, is um, just to also you know um, think a little bit more deeply actually about the relationship between science and diplomacy and international relations. So when you read a lot of literature on science and diplomacy, it tends to view science and diplomacy as two quite distinct things that can be put in instrumental use for one another. So how can you use diplomacy to advance science? Or how can you use scientific cooperation to advance diplomacy when there are otherwise political frictions? But what we see with this field of bioinformational diplomacy is that actually, you know, what, what the scientists are doing in their labs, the sequencing uh, of these pathogens, it's actually flowing up all the way into international relations, becoming a source of power for governments. It's generating new hierarchies in terms of who can, who has access to this data and who can harness it to protect their populations. Um, it's tying, you know, it's generating new security strategies around sequence data uh, and, and so forth. So it's, it's not just that these are really two separate fields, but it's really uh, also a story of, of co-production and how what happens in the scientific labs also actually ends up cascading all the way up uh, into the kind of macro institutions of, of international politics. So very much like, in a sense, like the 20th century international relations became profoundly shaped by nuclear physics especially through to, 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 uh, nuclear weapons. We're seeing in the 21st century, a similar kind of dynamic also in the life sciences, how this is beginning to, to reshape things. And I think uh, I'll leave it there because my time is up and I can see Adele is getting nervous that I'm not gonna stop soon. Okay, thank you very much. No, thanks Stefan, that was fascinating and perfectly timed. Thank you very much. Um, I'll hand over to uh, Daniela. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm delighted to join this event uh, and extremely grateful to Marianna and Cornelia for inviting me uh, um, as part of this visa event. Actually, it's my first uh, visa event. I only joined a general conference, but a few years ago, a uh, long time ago, actually. So I'm very happy to be to be back. And so thank you very much for this. Also uh, to, the, to the working group on, on foreign policy and to the working group on um, uh, uh, global health policy for uh, for giving me the, the chance to discuss a little bit about this topic, which is extremely uh, 
relevant and, and sensitive as Adele. Thank you for sharing Adele. As already told, uh, um, I have chosen a title which is probably a little bit too ambitious uh, because it, I, I chosen to reflect on the current uh, multilateral cooperation in the field. Um, but obviously, I'm not going to uh, to describe a major uh, major things because it's not the case. And uh, uh, what I would like to do is to offer uh, uh, some uh, uh, major aspects of the current um, multilateral cooperation, just emphasizing also the role of the uh, of the EU and the European countries at the same time. Uh, and more importantly, also to uh, uh, to offer some uh, insights of the major challenges uh, that we are currently uh, facing, but also that we are going to to face uh, um, uh, much more in in uh, in, uh, in a worsen conditions. I'm afraid in the post pandemic world, um, cooperation between the the EU and uh, um, European states and the World Health Organization has always been relevant at global level, as we know. But at the same time, the pandemic has currently revealed some significant failures that, it were, that were probably not so much expected. Uh, this is obviously not the first pandemic that the world um, is experiencing. However, it, has, it is revealing increasing um, and disconcerting uh, level of, levels of unpreparedness, uh, despite good intentions and commitments to be more accountable and share decision making, that what we see is a prevalent inactivity. Although we see that uh, several states are trying to take the lead uh, on this. Uh, so we can say that um, COVID-19 has sadly reminded the world that powerful Western countries are not only just as vulnerable uh, to disasters as any other country, but they are, they are often uh, ill-equipped in dealing with them. Uh, so this means that we need to, uh, um, to make more reflections on how states uh, approach and manage health issues and also in their capacities as members of international and regional organizations. And I particularly refer to reflections on policy cooperation on the need to increase capacity building and preparedness measures. And I would also like to emphasize the, uh, the overlap in terms of policy fields on which uh, uh, policy makers should uh, reflect more and more. So, as I said before, I will emphasize as major aspects of such cooperation and also some major challenges in terms of major aspects. Uh, first of all, I would like to draw your attention on the fact that we see in, uh, um, in the field, in this field, the health diplomacy, the same uh, shifting process that we can experience in all major policy fields. Uh, and I'm referring to the fact that uh, uh, diplomatic action is carried out right now in a completely different way, no longer limited to bilateral uh, uh, negotiations, to multilateral negotiations. And so there are more flexible and multi-layered um, forms of uh, uh, diplomatic relations, which um, are also beyond uh, traditional diplomacy, but also beyond traditional track diplomacy, let's say, and certainly uh, conducted uh, not only by professional diplomats. So um, this includes a variety of non-state actors, and also, as Stefan was saying, the use of technology and also the influence of social media, for example, as we are unfortunately experiencing with the pandemic um, and also the, uh, the, the access to vaccine and information about vaccines um, and also the, what we are experiencing in many countries, in, including Italy, for example, that people, people are, fear, are experiencing fear of, um, of vaccination and uh, they are putting themselves in the, in the position of choosing or having the access to choose different kinds of vaccine. Uh, so this means that information and social media are also important and they have an impact. Uh, they can have an impact on, on diplomatic relations as, as well as other non-state actors as of course pharmaceutical companies as we have uh, we, we know very well. So this means that um, from this perspective national interests 
uh, global values uh, uh, remain at the center, uh, but at the same time, there are more, um, more uh, global uh, issues that I would uh, refer to soft power issues like legitimacy, uh, public perception, identity, and all these uh, are, of course, gaining uh, more importance. Um, secondly, uh, policy cooperation uh, in the field has now been dominated by some um, nexus, let's say. So the first one is the health security nexus, which is relevant at global and regional level. Uh, so now countries uh, in Europe, not necessarily um, uh, EU member states, but uh, uh, looking at the, the, the region uh, um, um, largely, uh, becoming aware that uh, uh, mechanisms for a crisis response need to be integrated and adapted to new forms of cooperation between sectors. And I'm referring to policy field, different policy fields. So uh, intersections between health, foreign affairs, security, development are becoming more and more relevant. And this implies more commitment on the part of policy makers and political elite, uh, but that also require more competencies, uh, more uh, political willingness, I would say, but at the same time, also more uh, technical competencies as also we have seen uh, in Stefan's speech. Um, so this interconnections, let's say, are very, very difficult to be managed in, uh, in political terms, in terms of policy responses, uh, because I was telling before, it's, it's not just a problem of commitment on the part of state, but also problem of coordination among different states and coordination um, at a global level, as we are sadly experiencing. And at the same time, another very difficult uh, in, uh, interconnection uh, is, uh, to, is between um, health and development and the humanitarian action. Um, and we uh, see that it is not only a very difficult link to be managed, but it is not properly addressed, not at all. Uh, and I, this can bring us to the first challenge that we need to um, consider uh, more uh, in more in detail. So that the way through which the current humanitarian system has developed uh, do not always address crisis responses in the common interest of societies at large and in accordance to with humanitarian principles. And the most important thing, and now is now the connection with health issues and uh, diplomacy, is the fact that uh, the way humanitarian system is shaped right now cannot prevent the marginalization of some groups. So they are, we are uh, experiencing more vulnerable group, more vulnerable categories. This is not, of course, uh, an innovation of uh, in, in the fields of diplomacy, because of course, vulnerable, vulnerable people have always been exposed to the consequences of civil war, proxy war, violence, their prevention and the development. But the, uh, the way they are exposed to the effects of pandemic right now are shocking, um, uh, and are producing more shocking uh, implications because we see uh, uh, that some categories which were already very, very vulnerable are becoming more vulnerable. And so I'm referring to economic migrants, to refugees and asylum seekers who are ex escaping from wars, uh, civilians located in conflict zones and civilians located in poor and underdeveloped areas uh, towards which there is no proper um, uh, assistance on the part of states. And so we see uh, uh, on the other side, uh, uh, an increasing uh, assistance, level of assistance on the part of uh, uh, NGOs, for example, of other uh, humanitarian uh, uh, actors. Um, so uh, we can say, particularly if we consider uh, migrants and refugees who were already a, cry a European crisis, as we know very well before COVID-19, and things of course get, um, were, are getting worse and worse now. So the diversion of funds, the closure of borders and forced return in the name of national health uh, demonstrate that states and intergovernmental organizations, including the EU, of course, are failing not only to protect people, but also to, uh, to clearly understand who exactly should be protected. So a sort of uh, uh, rethinking of the paradigm of vulnerability is, is necessary, and it is very much uh, uh, um, related to public health, to global health, 
uh, and, uh, mm, and of course to, to the commitment on, on states. Um, so more importantly, uh, states are failing to realize that protection should be adapted and expand it depending on the crisis and needs. So of course, um, uh, the world, uh, the post-COVID-19 world will be uh, um, a world in which there will be more vulnerable people. And of course, nobody can think that uh, um, the crisis can be and the consequences of such crisis can be managed with the tools which are right now at the disposal of states and, and the EU. Uh, and then it was the first challenge, of course, but the second one uh, is also very much related to vaccine. So what we are experiencing, sadly, very sadly in India, for example, is that access to vaccine should be regulated. Uh, and it was not, obviously. And uh, um, so the, 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 the second the challenge is not only the, uh, the, the problem of uh, uh, providing uh, proper access to vaccine at a global level, but also uh, to manage the so-called vaccine nationalism. That's something that I, uh, of course, everybody has uh, recently uh, read uh, in, uh, about. So even before the pandemic, uh, the debates on how much protectionist trends or ideological divides in Europe were influencing health in a negative way were already ongoing, of course, but now the phenomenon is much more visible. And also the, the World Health Organization has expressed its concerns and, and also so the, this means also relations with the EU were not so good. Uh, so on the one hand, we have the formal uh, multilateral cooperation, which continues, but on the other, uh, this formal multilateral cooperation is challenged in, in, uh, in on field, in the practice, and uh, so criticism uh, is uh, rising more and more, particularly so the, the, the World, World Health Organization has expressed its concerns, um, particularly because on the implications that uh, this vaccine nationalism uh, can, can produce, because of course vaccines won't be accessible to the most uh, uh, underdeveloped regions. Uh, so we see that, uh, for example, providing vaccines, some more vaccines uh, to, uh, to India or these uh, uh, relations between uh, uh, European countries and, and the US on the, uh, the, the need to, to stop any patent, for example, is, is part of a diplomatic effort and at the same time humanitarian efforts because now helping India is becoming a humanitarian mission given uh, the, 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 the situation which the, 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 the difficult the situation the country is experiencing. So uh, this means that uh, the, the vaccine nationalism can become another an, an additional uh, um, uh, demonstration of political power uh, on the part of uh, um, a power uh, big powers in the world and also uh, producing continue to produce more inequality which is exactly what uh, this uh, um, uh, this multilateral cooperation wants to uh, uh, to fight um, and uh, I would like to end with a quote of a recent article that I have the chance to read in, from a journal which I usually don't read because it's a New England Journal of Medicine. I usually don't read uh, this kind of journal, but, but I, uh, since I'm working on, on vulnerability and how non-state actors are uh, tackling with it, uh, it came to, to, my, uh, to my attention and uh, uh, this, uh, this author was uh, discussing about um, a path forward from back vaccine nationalism to vaccine equity. So the vaccine equity is obviously uh, the, the, the aim to, towards which a multilateral cooperation should, uh, um, should um, tend to. Uh, and this path inevitably passes through an enhanced policy cooperation. But this is, and I stop here, this is my, my uh, conclusion. Uh, this is the biggest challenge for health diplomacy. Uh, so what I see from a more international relations perspective is the need to find a balance between what takes place at domestic level uh, in different sectors, in different policy fields, and what can be done uh, for contributing to global responsibilities and global commitments. Uh, nothing new, once again, because uh, we see uh, this struggle between domestic and, and national and global in several policy fields, but this is becoming more relevant uh, uh, 
if we want to have a vaccine equity. And uh, so this is, um, of course, a, a global uh, a, a achievement that every state wants to, to reach. So it, particularly in a post-pandemic world in which, once again, vulnerable will increase exponentially because we see that migration waves uh, do not stop, conflicts do not stop. So this will be a, an additional uh, challenge. Um, we uh, may expect uh, uh, the, that uh, this um, gap between what happens at domestic level and what happens at global level may increase. And it is exactly what we need to um, avoid. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Daniela, for that really rich paper and um, some really great synergies with what Stefan had to say as well. So thanks to both of you again. Um, so I'll open it to the floor and if people could use the hands up uh, function um, and or the chat and try and keep an eye on both. Um, we've got about we've got a good 15 to 20 minutes for questions. So, um, yeah, please. Indicate uh, Emma Louise. Yeah, Emma Louise Anderson, would you like to have a go? Would you like to go? Hello, if I can use my uh, computer to unmute. <laughs> um, thank you both for really rich talks and uh, wonderful to see everybody here. Um, I've got two questions for Stefan. The first is, so you, you talked a bit about um, the global inequalities in terms of health focusing in particular on the outcome. So people, so actors not wanting to commit because of the, the, the lack of equity in terms of the outcomes. But what I was interested is um, whether you could talk a bit about the kind of the lack of capacity of states. So inequalities in terms of um, the capacity of states to um, generate the sort of information to, to share. And then related to that is the question of the role of trust, because obviously, capacity and, and competency is, is, is part of trust. So I was, I was wondering if you could speak to those two things. Thank you. Adele, would you like me to respond straight away? Sorry, yes, I think so. I think we'll take them one by one. Great. Well, thank you, Emma, for your question and, and, and lovely to see you again. Um, the I think in terms of the capacity, there are also hugely differential capacities to actually sequence the data so um, um, around the world. Uh, but the capacity is expanding. And, and again, what complicates matters also is that increasingly the sequencing technology itself is also becoming mobile. So you can now, so, so even scientists from high income countries could go to an outbreak zone and use mobile sequencing equipment, which then kind of raises interesting questions about who owns that data at that point uh, and so forth. So there's, if you look at uh, the data that's being contributed, huge amounts of data, the vast majority comes from countries like UK, USA uh, and high income countries who, ha who have the high throughput and the high speed sequencing technology, but the technology is slowly spreading uh, around the world. But so there, there are inequalities, as you rightly say, on both aspects. The question of trust is, is I'm glad you raised it because it's actually central to all of this. So, you know, one, one of the things that, you know, when they built GenBank in the past, right, they the scientists thought they were they were fighting the good fight because GenBank came out of a culture of of the kind of human genome project, and there was there was a public effort to decode the human genome, and there was a parallel private effort, and the scientists in 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 in, in the public effort really wanted to make sure that the human genome would belong to the world and would not be carved up by, by private interests, and so they thought by putting it into a public domain database like GenBank. That was the best thing they could do because they were effectively it becomes prior art in, in kind of legal uh, IP jargon and so therefore it belongs to the world and, and cannot be patented. But what we saw in the context and later during global health emergencies is that low-income countries in particular felt very aggrieved when they would send their samples 
who scientists in high income countries, they would sequence and then they would deposit in GenBank. And often those scientists would be required to deposit in GenBank either by the journals as part of the publication process or by the funder. But the low income country says, well, you're giving away potentially our intellectual property because you are making the decision that you're putting it into the public domain and you're giving it away. And then other people are going to use the data to make vaccines and diagnostics, but we tend not to get them. Uh, once they are produced, or we cannot, we cannot afford them. And so they lost trust in the system. And so, so what GizAid does through this data licensing mechanism is it, it has actually built much more trust with low and middle income countries in particular, because they know there are additional protections in place. And that if scientists in high income countries do their analyses, they have to acknowledge the data contributors, even when they come from low and middle income countries. Um, and that, you know, there's, it, it, there are rules and restrictions around this. And, and GizAid can be quite, um, you know, if, if they find that, that, that scientists are violating um, uh, the spirit of the, of the data sharing agreement, uh, their access can be suspended to GizAid. Or, you know, they, they, they can uh, get lawyers to write them letters saying that they're violating, et cetera. So, so GizAid has built... Uh, uh, a lot more trust than the public domain systems in, in a lot of low and middle income countries. But it's it's now just becoming a huge political issue because the success of GizAid is also creating many problems for the scientists who just would love to use the data without any additional restrictions because they believe that's the best for science and, and so forth. So thank you. Thanks, I've got Christian Haddad. Yeah, thank you so much <clears throat> to both speakers for this um, stimulating um, talks. I have a question on um, biomed uh, bioinformational diplomacy and COVID because I was wondering, the story that we hear is that data sharing at the beginning more than a year ago um, was not that problematic. There was some cover up at the beginning, very couple of days or weeks, but then when it became known there was free sharing. So. I was wondering what is the role of um, bioinformation and diplomacy in COVID as COVID becomes a, a, a kind of a chronic condition and more and more mutant strains emerge and um, how does this map on the geopolitics of where these mutant strains emerge? Do you have any, any observations on that, Stefan? It would be great, thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Christian, and lovely to see you again uh, as, as well. And um, so I think what COVID shows is that, you know, a lot also depends actually a little bit on the on the epidemiological profile also of, 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 of the outbreak. Because of course, part of what makes um, COVID different, say from previous outbreaks like Ebola, which were geographically more, more contained, is that in a very short period of time, um, SARS-CoV-2 really went went around the world, and so kind of everybody had virus circulating within their countries that they could isolate uh, 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 and sequence, and and that that changes the things a little bit as well. But what you still see even in COVID is that that GizAid is getting a lot more data than GenBank, right? And and so it's really in an outbreak. You know, all of these sensitivities around IP, around north-south inequalities, around um, uh, around being scooped by scientists, they also exist in during normal scientific research, but they just become escalated and dramatized and and intensified in an acute outbreak. You know, when there's when there's an acute threat of a large-scale loss of life, all of this thing all of a sudden becomes even more profound, and 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 that's in in my view. I think why GizAid is winning at the moment is because the, the, the data becomes even more sensitive in an outbreak and, and people would be more hesitant to share this data unless they have additional protections. And because GizAid gives that protection, it has very quickly come a long way and now surpassed GenBank. Um, but it, it does also strike at the heart of, of, of you know, scientific and philosophical debates about open science uh, and the un, un, unrestricted uh, uh, use of data. And, and so I think what you have is here you have, on the one hand, a kind of scientific desire. It, it, it's just so much easier if you don't have any additional restrictions on the data uh, versus conditions of equity that, that there are still differential capacities to exploit that kind of unrestricted data. And, and so you end up in a cycle of, of, of just intensifying and reinforcing inequalities, even though that's 
what nobody is necessarily out there uh, out there to do. Um, and so I think with with you know COVID has been huge because it's really brought it's dragged kind of Gizade also out of just the influenza field and and made it now. I mean every, when you see these heat maps with red dots, you know when you see next strain, when you see talk about B one one, most of the time it's all based based on, on Gazette data. And that's why I think things are really going to heat up now. Uh, and, 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 and there is going to be a battle uh, between the public domain and, and the, and the Gazette data, data licensing model. I hope that answers the question a little bit. Thanks. Thanks, Christian, for your question. Um, I have a question um, for both of you, because I think you, you both touched on um, the role of information as a tool of diplomacy and um, the commercial side of it as well. Um, and you both talked about how we have so many more actors in diplomacy now, not just sort of traditional diplomats. Um, I guess, I mean, that that has been looked at in IR and diplomacy before. So thinking of um, the idea of epistemic communities or um, Anne-Marie Slaughter's work on the role of technocrats so i wondered is there something new is there something different um with with how those things are playing out around covid and also stefan you mentioned this almost pseudo diplomacy that you see among scientists and i wondered is that do we want to look at the practices amongst themselves and seeing how they operate or are you seeing what they're doing is being integrated into more formal diplomatic channels, or is it is it is it both? Are they sort of involved in international diplomacy, to use the word international in its traditional way, and also sort of they're engaging in these what look like diplomatic practices amongst themselves in a separate way, or is it more is it more integrated than that? Um, I don't know who wants to go go first. Daniela, would you like to go? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, quite very briefly, uh, thanks for bringing non-state actors in, on the table. <laughs> Actually, this is my main research interest. Uh, so I've always been interested in analyzing the role of, and the roles, more than one actually, of various non-state actors in, uh, in international relations and public diplomacy in different fields. And as I mentioned before, um, also track diplomacy uh, is a perfect example of for uh, um, understanding how uh, NGOs, but not necessarily NGOs, but also you know third parties, let's say, have been very influential in conflict resolution, conflict management, in peace mediation, and also of course in other uh, in, in in different fields, policy fields like environmental issues and health issues as well. Um, so yeah, you mentioned epistemic communities, and uh, this is the the the, the label which. In, in some policy fields that can fit very well to NGOs, for example, uh, because NGOs can also offer not only uh, practical assistance, but most of the time also uh, some competencies which are now becoming very relevant for states and international organizations, as we know at EU level, at UN level, and also World Health Organization, of course. In the specific field of uh, information and disinformation, and also in, in, as for COVID, 19 because this is how it happened that I started to be interested in this as I was working on uh, NGOs towards migrants and refugees and then uh, the, the pandemic started and uh, so I started also to, to analyze uh, their, their assistance and roles in these un, 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 unfortunate times. So what we can see is that there, there is a rising of uh, new uh, tasks. So they are traditional tasks, tasks which are uh, traditionally associated to uh, uh, non-state actors, mainly NGOs uh, are uh, um, emphasized. But we also have new tasks like, of course, um, uh, uh, like opening new spaces for deliberation because they are trying to uh, support those communities in many European countries which had no access to uh, uh, medical treatment, for example, or uh, to, to hospitals. And they also started to fight against the disinformation. Uh, this is also something which had started uh, um, some years before, some years ago, uh, when uh, during the terrorist attacks, 
to in, in France and Germany when uh, you know migrants and refugees were at the core of a securitization process and they were tackled as a security issue and now they are perceived as an health issue for uh, European communities. Uh, so this information fighting, this information is also becoming something uh, which is important for, uh, um, for NGOs, for example, and this can also bring to uh, more, uh, um, let's say, more roles and more uh, rooms for uh, policy debates. So this is something that states should necessarily uh, manage uh, at some point. Thanks. Yeah, so thank, thanks, uh, Adele, for those questions. And I, th I, I take the point about, you know, uh, about information and diplomacy. And it, in a sense, you, you could say, well, when has diplomacy ever not been about information and about getting information, uh, you know, also from, from, from others? Um, but I suppose what I'm trying to tease out here is, you know, in the field of, of pandemics and, and global health emergencies, there has been a, a critical change that is politically significant. So in, in the past, you know, when you still needed access to biological specimens of, of the virus, this actually gave um, outbreak, outbreak countries quite a bit of power and leverage. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of, so during bird flu H5N1, uh, where Indonesia had the most cases of H5N1 in infection, right? Indo Indonesia said, well, actually, we're going to stop sharing our viruses until there's reform and there's more equitable, equitable distribution of, of, of the benefits that, that come from virus sharing. And, and, and the Indonesian health minister at the time launched the notion of viral sovereignty, right? So the, the kind of materiality of, of the need for access to the specimen ha ha gave them a kind of strategy of, of resistance. Effectively, they could leverage access to virus samples as a way for, 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 for negotiating for, for structural reform. What's happening now with the rise of, of bioinformation and particular sequence data is that it's now possible increasingly for, for companies to generate new, uh, new biomedical inter interventions without actually needing physical specimens. They can do it just with the sequence data. And so this is the, 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 the shift from the kind of specimal to the informational then actually has massive political ramifications because low and middle income countries all of a sudden have much less, much less leverage on the diplomatic stage uh, in, in order to fight for more, for, for, for greater equity and, and, and justice. And this then also ties into your second question about the, about the scientists, I think, because, um, you know, yes, we, we know about epistemic communities and, and we know that scientists increasingly participate and, and put, have knowledge inputs into diplomatic processes. But I'm after something a little bit different here, which, which is that, you know, what strikes me, especially about the Gizade Initiative, which is which started as a collaboration between scientists and, and a philanthropist uh, uh, and, and not a government uh, initially is, is, you know, scientists are also quite clever and ingenious in try of sourcing the kind of data and the resources that they need internationally uh, uh, for their work. And this, this is a kind of subfield. This is different from how do they input into formal political process. It's a type of kind of proto or I call it infra diplomacy that they themselves conduct because they're constantly having to navigate political boundaries, getting visa for scientists to come and visit, getting the data to move. And this requires actually a lot of cognitive and practical work uh, I think from them to, to get this stuff to flow, and 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 this I think could be opened up much more as a as as an area of research in its own right. And then, of course, what they end up doing when scientists start sequencing pathogens in their labs, uh, we also see another connection here, which again isn't the connection they are participating in formal diplomatic activity, but we are seeing that then now that the sequence data becomes available. We're seeing that governments are actually saying, actually, you know what, we need to have intergovernmental negotiations also about how we're going to handle the sharing of such kind of pathogen sequence data in future. So now under the Nagoya Protocol or under the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework, there are new diplomatic negotiations that are happening that have to happen because of what scientists are doing in their laboratories. And so that's, I think, another link that goes beyond just kind of the epistemic community stuff. I can see we're coming uh, towards the end of our time, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to, to keep going on.
Thanks, Stefan. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of minutes left. We do have, um, uh, I'd like to get Katrina in if we can, Katrina Gold. So Katrina, if you could ask a question, um, and if, if, we could, if we could ask for question and responses to be, to be brief, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, those are both really interesting talks and uh, actually I actually had a question for, you know, both presenters or whoever feels most like answering. Um, uh, I was wondering about how you see the kind of technology structures or practices for gathering and sharing information about people and viruses that you're familiar with moving beyond this particular pandemic or even beyond health questions altogether. Um, and so, and also to what extent do you think, you know, potential for broader utility or future uses of technologies and practices has been factored into the pandemic responses you've been looking at? Because obviously the question of, you know, future implications is very present um, in the sort of patent discussions at the moment, but also stuff like the UK plan to use facial recognition in vac vaccine passports. That kind of, for me, raises a number of questions about the extent to which anticipation is playing into interventions. And so I was just wondering if you would be able to speak to that. Thank you. Perhaps if I can ask Daniela to, to respond to that one. Yeah, I think it's up to Stefan to be more competent on that. Thanks. Stefan, if you've got a, a few words in response. Yeah, just briefly. So what, 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 what I think what strikes me for, for information in general uh, is um, a, a notion um, that, I, that I call data passporting. And you, you also mentioned, Katrina, the, the, the vaccine passporting, right? So there's, there's, there's a difference between what happens in terms of how information is, is kind of generated and structured internally and then how it's exploited. But there's a whole nother question of how do you actually get information to move across borders? Um, and I think this is, you know, there tends to be this kind of assumption that information just flows freely and, you know, it's all information nowadays. Well, actually, you know, what we see in the sequence here is actually, it actually requires a lot of effort to get this data to flow and to work. And so setting out, you know, Gizade sets out conditions around the data that facilitates its international movement, especially its rapid and widespread international movement. It's what I call data passporting. And so to me, this might be the note, I've um, recently written a piece about this, which has come out in the, uh, in the European Journal of International Relations, where I talk more about this notion of data passporting. And I think this might be a kind of uh, thing to think, to, 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 to think about more, to see information, not just as information, but to see information as also being tied in with issues of, of, of equity and sovereignty uh, and so therefore data passporting becomes a really important practice, I think. Thanks, Stefan. Um, thanks everyone, sorry to run over by um, a couple of minutes. I think it's a sign of how fascinating the papers were that we've had this vibrant discussion as well. Um, I'd like to thank Daniela and um, Stefan once again um, for coming along to join us and preparing those papers. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying um, if, if anyone here is not a member of the Global Health Working Group but is interested in our work, um, then, then do drop us a line. Hope to see you at the General Conference, at the General Conference, sorry, I sound like we're at the UN, the annual conference next month. Um, so our email address is ghwg.group at visa.ac.uk and the address for the Foreign Policy Working Group is fpwg dot group at visa.ac.uk um, and I'll just hand over to Cornelia to see if she wants to say anything about um, the work of the foreign policy working group. Thank you very much uh, Adele and thank you very much Daniela and Stefan for your excellent inputs and I do hope that we will have the possibility to continue this debate in other frameworks. Um, and just wanted to emphasize a couple of words on the activities of the foreign policy working group. Um, as uh, Adele mentioned, I'm the deputy convener of the working group and uh, we are planning um, uh, an event, we are having an event on uh, critical approaches to foreign policy on the 18th of May, which we are conducting, um, which are, we were organizing jointly with the British Association for Middle Eastern Studies. So everyone um, interested in critical approaches to foreign policy is, inviting to, is, is invited to uh, join us there. We are also planning another event in June, a book discussion. So stay tuned with our newsletter, which we are now sending out monthly. And uh, you are happy to, and we are, we are, you are uh, welcome to subscribe to our newsletter. 
uh, you will be able to find out more information um, about the work of our working uh, group on foreign policy on the website, which uh, was posted, I think, in the in the chat on the BISA website. And uh, yeah, we also hope we will have a productive annual conference at BISA, and we hope to see you many of, uh, of you there. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Thank you, Adele. Great, thanks again. Thanks everyone for coming. I um, hope to see you at future events and thanks again to our speakers and for those who asked great questions. And oh, of course, and Chrissy for setting up all the technical side. Thank you very much as well. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. for inviting Thank me. Daniela, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.